I had a bit of a think about what to put into this because I've been researching for about five years. So um, it's a bit of a consolidation, I think, of the highlights, basically. Um, I've managed to get a few publications out of the research I did. So if anybody wants copies of them, then I can send them through with a bit more detail. But I've just kind of done a bit of a, an overview of this. So I've called it um, Better the Devil You Know, like Kylie in my head. Um, examining the promises and pitfalls of Claire's Law. So um, what got me interested in this particular policy is finding out whether or not it actually works. Uh, five years down the line, I'm still not sure whether or not it works, but I have a better of an idea of the way in which it operates and maybe some, some strengths and limitations of it. So that's kind of what I'm going to look at today. There we go. So um, by way of a bit of an overview, I'm sure people are possibly familiar, but just in case, uh, Claire's Law, the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, came about as a result of campaigning following the death of Claire Wood. Um, she was killed by her former partner um, after they'd separated, they'd had a bit of a turbulent relationship, it got more turbulent after her death. She'd gone to the police, Greater Manchester Police, several times, um, indicating his escalating violence. They knew that he had a history of violence, they didn't disclose it because at that point there was ambiguity over whether or not that could be done. Um, and so following a campaign led by her father, who sadly passed away over the summer, and a coroner in her case, who also sadly passed away earlier this year, and um, a national newspaper, they got together and uh, really lobbied for this idea of Claire's Law or access to the information. So the fundamentals of it is that it offers people the right to ask for background information on a person about whom they have concerns or about whom they're in a relationship with and um, they have concerns about their own safety. So prior to this, it existed in a guise under the right to know, and that was where statutory agents, so police or social services or other people who've got safeguarding responsibilities, could uh, proactively disclose information that they held in order to ensure the safeguarding of a person they deemed at risk. So the right to ask element um, gave the public the opportunity to go to the police and ask for information about a person who in the policy is known as the subject. Um, and they can um, go down that process autonomously themselves. So it was piloted initially for um, a period of time from about 2011 and then it was implemented nationally in uh, 2014, which is when I started researching it. And uh, from then it's gone more international. So um, there's some states in Australia and Canada have brought it in. Um, obviously it's expanded out to Northern Ireland and to Scotland under slightly different guises, but it's essentially the same policy. Um, and it's also featuring in the forthcoming domestic abuse bill, which is trundling on. Um, so this uh, essentially seeks to put it on a statutory footing. So at the minute it's not, it's just a policy that is kind of akin to guidelines. So it is implemented in different ways, quite different ways across um, different police forces. It's just one of the issues I'm going to be talking about later on. So, promise it. So we'll start with the good stuff. Um, the the point of this policy was to give more power and autonomy to people who were concerned about their relationship or, or people that they're in a relationship with, to be able to empower them, which was Theresa May's words when she brought it in as Home Secretary, uh, empower them to make a decision about whether or not to continue in the relationship. So it's designed to be victim focused. Um, and certainly there's an awful lot of victims which it could apply to. So domestic violence, significantly um, prevalent type of crime. Um, just taking the recent data from the Crime Survey of England and Wales, estimates that to the year end March 2019, 1.6 million women and just under 800,000 men aged 16 to 59 experienced domestic abuse in the 12 months prior. Um, in the same time period as that, the police recorded approximately 750,000 domestic abuse related crimes. So these are significant numbers. There were a 24% increase on the previous year for police recorded crimes. Um, we know the nature of domestic violence. It's repetitive, it's cyclical, it usually happens over the life course. So they're not singular incidents. 
So when we're looking at victims versus looking at incidents, there's uh, much more depth to the types of victimization we're looking at. So empowering people to be able to take control over their exposure to violence or their potentiality of risking experiencing it is not only important, but is obviously very politically attractive to be able to do that. Um, in light of the ongoing pandemic, and the numbers of domestic violence uh, cases are going to be quite skewed. So um, I'll look at that to some extent. But it was designed to give some more um, ownership over a person's safety to that person. It also provides access to otherwise restricted information. So ordinarily, the types of information, if held on a person uh, that's requested by the member of the public, can't be accessed um, unless the certain thresholds have been met or there's a safeguarding issue, as I mentioned before. So it provided a new way of accessing information that had proven to be quite popular and certainly politically popular. Um, when a similar policy came out some time ago, uh, there was law, so the sex offender uh, regulation. Uh, it's also seen to enhance victim autonomy. So um, generally when people talk about it in the public or when um, I speak to people about it, it's positively received. People tend to think it's a good thing that it's uh, information that they feel they should be entitled to, that it's of relevance to them, um, and that it allows them to have some control or help them in a third party application um, situation. If they have concerns over somebody else's safeguarding, that they can do something, they can apply for this information on their behalf. So it does have quite a positive um, rep uh, reputation in terms of uh, enhancing victim comfort. In the media, there's often a rhetoric of it saving lives. Now, this is one of the things that got me into this research in the first place, to see whether or not it is saving lives. Still haven't quite worked out if it is. Um, but there's an awful lot of assumption in that very small quotation of, of this idea that it's saving lives. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail in the next slide. But it is badged on the idea of being a positive way of addressing domestic violence and allowing people to move on in a positive way with their lives. Um, but it only really looks at part of the issue, which is possibly a pitfall. Um, and then finally, it's also over its evolution. So there've been several different changes to it, um, which are possibly better facilitated by it not being um, statutory grounded, but also it is guidelines. So these are uh, updated. So recognition of relationship dynamics. So when it first came in, um, if you were a member of the public who applied for a Claire's Law disclosure about somebody, and in the period of time it took for that decision to be made, you separated with your partner, you rendered your application void, null and void. So you weren't seen to be in a um, position of risk anymore, therefore you didn't need this information, therefore the police wouldn't disclose it. And this was quite problematic, obviously the the variable fluctuating nature of domestic abuse and violence means that people do often separate and get back together. Um, but it doesn't mean that the information is not as important as it would have been at the point which they requested it. So it was good to see the government responding to criticism about this. They removed the separation clause. They recognised that um, you know, the, the rigid nature of a policy like this is perhaps less effective in the type of uh, abuse or victimization which is designed but in looking at it from a positive perspective from a promise uh, it has evolved it has um, adapted with uh, critique and with insight and therefore there is potential for it to do it again but uh, there are pitfalls uh, quite a few more pitfalls so spend a bit more time on this one. <laughs> So firstly, uh, the operational costs are grossly underestimated when it came in. So following the pilot, there was a pilot assessment where um, the government were very enthusiastic about this particular policy because they estimated that there would be approximately 500 requests a year. This would cost the police just under um, 0.39 million in time and resources, but the savings would yield over 260 million for 0.2 percent reduction in domestic violence. Um, however, in the first year, as the pilot assessment indicated, there were over 4,000 applications. 
So the figures have to be revised quite considerably. Now this has ramifications because the policy was kind of brought in as a somewhat knee-jerk reaction. It wasn't proper um, resourced, there wasn't uh, additional funds given over to it. The, the infrastructure that was needed as well wasn't quite there. So flagging up domestic abuse consistently across police national computer. If that wasn't done, that meant that there was a, additional work that had to be done, going searching for this information. If something wasn't logged as a domestic incident, it might not show up in a, a later application. So what looks like a quick win um, was perhaps not quite the case. And we know that police budgets have already been stretched and um, people might be uh, seeking more information as they become more aware of this policy. So it really needs to have proper financial infrastructure and funding underpinning it. It's also somewhat misleading in its terminology. So it's not a law, it's a policy. There is no statutory underpinning, as I mentioned before. Um, people have a, a right to ask in the sense that they have the opportunity and they're able to ask, but they don't necessarily have a right to the information. Um, that's very much dependent on criteria that people perhaps are less familiar with this notion of uh, criteria or a threshold that they have to meet in order to access this information, which is uh, problematic. And in some cases, certainly with male domestic violence victim advocates and, and organisations, the use of the term Claire's Law might be seen as kind of gendered, that it's mainly just for women. Um, I don't know, but I'd be interested to know if there was any similar criticisms or, or concerns around Sarah's Law, um, or that was just seen to apply to all children or sex offender um, issues. But certainly with Claire's Law, it's come up a few times that people feel that perhaps it's ostracising uh, on the basis of being seen colloquially as just for women. Um, a big thing that I have around this is the specificities of domestic violence. So I mentioned earlier about the cyclical and repeat nature of it, and um, the fact that it can be quite messy, quite chaotic, um, or it can be the type of violence and victimization that a person doesn't recognize as harmful or abusive or problematic until perhaps it's too late. So very much depending on a person's background or their own understanding of what a, a harmful or a not harmful relationship is. This type of policy requires you to go and actively seek out information, which means that you have to actively be aware that you might need this information. Um, which means that you need to be mindful and cognizant of the fact that your partner might be abusive. And this might not always be the case. Um, some people might not recognize the behavior as abusive, or they might not want to uh, face up to it. There's minimalization, denial in terms of domestic abuse. And there's also the um, kind of like rubber band effect of people growing apart, coming back together, maybe splitting up and coming back together, which means that it might work against the person seeking information if it seemed to be um, something that is not necessarily in their best interest to have. Um, another big issue I have with it is uh, this responsabilization. So it's kind of overarching responsibilization. So as well as the active citizenship that requires people um, take the initiative to go to the police insofar as they feel that they can or they feel comfortable doing that and requesting information, um, it then requires somebody to do something afterwards. So either while you're waiting to find out the status of your application, if there's a disclosure forthcoming or not, you have to manage yourself potentially around your partner and um, not give anything away um, because your partner would, is otherwise unaware that you've made this application to find out about their, their background. You are more aware of your safeguarding needs. You might be more aware of the vulnerability or risk that you're at. And then if a disclosure is forthcoming, you are responsibilized to do something with that information. Either you stay in the relationship and manage it with the information that you now have, or you seek to exit the relationship, um, but without having being able to tell anybody about it because you're under the Data Protection Act, you can't share this information with anybody else. If you stay and people find out that you heard this information, the victim blaming is already a big thing, this could make it worse. And if you go, uh, there may be other issues that I'm going to come on to in a bit. So it puts an awful lot of focus on what victims do or don't do. Um, but the degree to which they're aware of this at the point of the application is um, it's, it's not clear. 
another key point is that it potentially enhances their risk. So this is something I became aware of when I did some interviews with independent domestic violence advisors in that they were seeing people who were uh, medium to high risk. And then when they mentioned about Claire's Law, it turned out that they, their clients had already had one. Um, and it's that management process of getting the information that had uh, not gone well and the violence had escalated and they'd ended up as a serious or, or medium to high risk domestic violence victim. So in some cases, this is because uh, people perhaps are forced into a situation where they have had a disclosure, they know something about their partner that they can't share with their partner or anybody else. And then this can change the dynamics or the nature of the relationship, or it might accidentally come out during an argument. And then there's the whole issue around secrecy and trust, which could be problematic. Um, if they want to uh, exit the relationship, if they if their fears or suspicions about their partner are um, certified as a result of this information, then we know from a, a wealth of feminist research that for a significant proportion of women, this is the most risky time. And it certainly was for Claire. She had left the relationship at the point in which her ex killed him. So it could um, be enhancing victims' risk of further harm from that particular perpetrator. They might exit the relationship and go into another relationship where they're at harm from that perpetrator. And you know, Claire's law doesn't protect them from other people. It just gives them information about that person. Um, and it's, it can give them a, a false sense of security that maybe they're safe. They leave the person that it's not going to happen. But of course, that doesn't mean the violence not going, is going to stop. And there's been a couple of cases where the time it takes between the application and someone finding out whether or not they're going to have a disclosure of information has been um, unfortunately too long and it's uh, resulted in fatalities of people who have sought out information. So um, the six weeks or so that it takes from the point of applying to the point of culmination of the process, in some cases um, so that standardization is, is not working in people's favour. Um, I'm also interested in the accessibility of the policy. So it's somewhat reliant on domestic violence in the first place for it to work, because if there hasn't been a history of violence towards women, then there's no um, information that can be shared. But we know that most domestic violence victims don't go to the police. They, their experiences don't come to the attention of the police. A lot of violence against women doesn't get recorded as violence against women. So there's fallacies in, in what can be accessed in terms of the policy. But for those who do seek out information through it, the police are meant to record the gender, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and disability status of both the applicant and the subject, the person about whom they're seeking information. And this is important to know who is and isn't accessing it in terms of demographics and background. Um, but also to shed light on some of the reports that might come through through a very basic reading of statistical data. So for example, um, the policy allows for third party application if you want to apply on somebody else's behalf for information that if it's forthcoming will be shared with them. Um, and it's important to know whether or not the number of male applicants are actually applying on their own behalf or for their own information in the relationship um, or they're applying on behalf of somebody else because if it's the type of policy that isn't um, being used by men, then there may be an issue there around whether or not there's a, uh, people are um, not engaging with it because they don't feel like it's representative of them. Similarly for people from um, minority backgrounds or uh, minority sexual orientations, etc. So it's really important to get that data to see who is engaging with it. Um, and then another big issue that I have with it is that there's no statutory aftercare or follow-up. So this um, kind of stands to reason because there's no funding behind it. But as soon as the police and anybody that accompanies them to give a disclosure to a person who's applied, who has been told this information to disclose, as soon as they've done that, the person's just kind of left, the recipient is just left to get on with it. So they are provided with information on domestic violence charities and organizations, but um, obviously those charities and organizations aren't given any extra funding to deal with these particular victims or, or people seeking information but there's there's no way of logging what happens next unless that person that recipient comes to the attention of the police or an IDVA later on because of the escalation and violence 
And that to me, I think is a huge um, omission, a huge oversight that there's, there could be so much going on there and so much to know that uh, currently there's no way of, of knowing what is happening. Um, and this is additionally problematic because recipients are prohibited from sharing the information and um, quite rightly because it's subject to certain um, privacy laws. But at the same time, you know, they've probably told someone they're going to apply. They may well have gone with somebody to do the whole application. And then they're not allowed to tell anybody what has come out of it. Or if they do, they risk criminalization under the Data Protection Act. And that can be quite mentally traumatic on top of everything else. Um, and then another key point is that this interpretation of statistical information. So while the media are very good for um, around about International Women's Day every year, kind of doing a roundup of how many applications have been in a particular locality, how many disclosures. There's, this is very like, superficial to just look at the numbers and think they'll match. So not all applications will result in disclosures. As we've seen before, not all people go to the police about domestic violence. So it could be that there is a history there, the police just not aware of it, but they ought to be very mindful to let people know that just because there is no history on record with them doesn't mean that the fears that have caused a person to go and apply in the first place are not founded. Um, but there's lots of other reasons why they won't result in a disclosure. So some of the things that came out when I looked into it was that the applications were more suited to, Claire, sorry, to Sarah's law. Um, they might be uh, have been moved on to a different police force because they're more relevant to their uh, the person perhaps seems to have not met the criteria. Now, this is important in terms of what people know to be able to apply. So in order to meet the threshold to um, prove that there's a safeguarding risk to disclose the information and not fall foul of the law, it's important that those applying give as much information about the issues that they have concerns with as possible so that the police can make a robust decision on their application. So if people don't know this, or if they minimise it, or if they you know, try to deny it because they, they don't want to think of their partner in a, in a bad way, then they may not meet that threshold and they may not get a disclosure. So there's never going to be a 100% disclosure rate. Um, there should be a 100% like, outcome rate. So we should know what happens to all those applications. But it's very unlikely that all of them will result in a disclosure. I'd be very suspicious if they did, because that seems like the police would have a lot more information them as domestic violence researchers, we know that they have. So, in terms of some um, recommendations, some things that having researched this for a bit that I'm uh, thinking about. So, one is, and I know this is improving, but it'd be good to see a continuation of improvement. Uh, better and more consistent monitoring of domestic abuse incidents on the police national computer. So, flagging these up. Um, as domestic abuse or violence against women, so that when applications are made, this information is um, more easily accessible, it can be provided. I know the police are getting a lot better with the type of information they're providing, so it's moved from he has a history of violence to he um, you know, put his ex in hospital after coming off with him in Sheffield or something. So, so the person who's seeking the information can have a bit more understanding and knowledge and maybe even see parity with some of the things that they're experiencing themselves so the information is more meaningful but that requires better data um, collation at the pnc level and one way perhaps of um, helping with this might be the creation of scrutiny panels so um, when i was previously living in sheffield i was on a hate crime scrutiny panel and this is where you know, stop hate uk used to run it you'd look at a case from like start to finish and look at the good and not so good practices, offer commendations and recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, but it was designed to be like a helping hand. It wasn't um, meant to be a kind of a draconian thing. It was meant to improve the uh, experience for both the victim and also the police. Um, more guidance and assistance for applicants at the point of application also be really important. This came out from uh, some of the discussions I had with independent domestic violence advisors, they um, only see domestic violence victims who are medium or serious risk if they've been assigned to them. If they work with uh, independently or with the police or with any organisations, then they will have more engagement with domestic violence victims more generally. But there's no linking of somebody who might go to the police for Claire's Law 
who perhaps have never been to any domestic violence organization or engage with any domestic violence expert. There's no way of linking them into those people. So, um, and it might be the case, particularly in those situations where the six week wait has been too long and it's proved to um, result in fatality, that perhaps an earlier intervention of domestic violence specialism, regardless of the outcome of the application, is important to try and uh, capture those issues early on. Also, uh, better, more consistent monitoring of DVDS applications and outcomes on the PMT, including post disclosure follow up. So, I mean, what is happening? What, what are people doing with this information? Um, are they staying in the relationship? Are they leaving the relationship? Are they telling their partners? Are they telling anybody else? Um, I've got a, a huge survey that I'm still kind of tweaking with that I'm firing out at some point to try and find some of this information out because I'm still very curious about it. But anecdotally, it seems to be that, you know, it's, it's very much dependent on people's social circle or their ability to exit a relationship. Um, obviously, issues such as financial dependency come in here or, or people's fear or um, concerns, trepidations around what their partner might do if they leave. But certainly, I think it's incumbent in some way to find out you've just given somebody this information that's very important about somebody that they're very close to who doesn't know they have this information. And we recognize that they could be, and in some cases, at greater risk of incurring harm. I think there should be some way of finding out at some point, you know, what, what happened, what did they do? Um, and then clearer direction to recipients about um, that they can contact domestic violence ch charities without falling foul of the Data Protection Act. So while they're instructed that they can't tell anyone, very often police will um, provide disclosures with somebody from a domestic violence charity or background um, expertise with them, like in tandem, where possible. So for some of the people that I spoke to doing that, they were saying that, you know, well, I'm a domestic violence expert and I know about it. You, know, you can go and talk to another domestic violence expert. It's the same sort of thing. Um, because there were some real concerns and anxieties around going and sharing what they could say or if they were going to phone up this organization, what they were allowed to tell them about why they were there. Obviously, greater funding, we always talk about greater funding, but certainly there does need to be a lot more funding resourcing for domestic violence generally, um, both in the statutory and voluntary sectors. But thinking about if this policy is really to take off and to stay, um, which it is, obviously, if it is put on a statutory footing, it looks like it is staying, then um, to do justice to it, both from the statutory and, and the voluntary sectors, it really does have to have that financial infrastructure to allow for capacity and resourcing to make sure that it's, uh, it operates in the way that it's intended to. And then finally, perhaps more focus on addressing domestic abuse and ensuring how to recognize the signs of abusive behavior in a partner. The one thing this policy doesn't do is address perpetration or um, anything to do with that. So um, it's victim focused in the sense that it might just move victims from one person to another one or move um, you know, a, an abuser from one person to another person. It doesn't address uh, their abusive behaviors. Um, it's, it's, I suppose, in a way, it, it can only do certain things and it's only designed to do certain things, but without a, a greater focus on addressing domestic abuse to actually reduce it in the first place, you're just kind of displacing it. Um, and I think a lot more could be done around recognizing uh, signs of abusive behavior in the, in the partner. So if people are unsure, unaware of the kind of things that they're experiencing, um, knowing that these are harmful behaviours are, are important things for them to be able to access this policy in the first place. Okay, so that was my little whirlwind overview of it.